All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to our, I guess, first official outdoor tent service at Glenview. Woo! Glad that, glad that the rain held off and Woo! that we have a nice breeze. So we're just praying up here for our sakes that the breeze doesn't blow everything off our music stand. So if you see us running, please, if you wouldn't mind helping us a little bit, we'd appreciate it. <laughs> Let's stand and worship the Lord together. If you haven't gotten the song sheets, they are back. Um, next to the time box, let's sing together, One Thing Remains. from the rooftops in through the neighborhoods and the communities that your love never fails it never gives up and it never runs out you are more than enough father we thank you for this time where we can gather to worship and praise you and lift your name on high lord remove the distractions anything that maybe we have coming up or that we have come up that just seem to be holding us down or or, or taking a part of our mind lord 
We want to release that to you, and we want to listen to what you have to say to each one of us this morning. Father, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. A couple of reminders uh, for uh, announcements as we continue our worship service this morning. Uh, first of all, the American Red Cross Blood Drive is scheduled for August 27th from 2 to 7.30 here at the church. And uh, sign up at redcrossblood.org if you have not done so already. We have two upcoming biker rides, one on August the 30th and one on September uh, 27th. And I believe 11.45 is the meet time here at the church. So please see uh, Eric Fisher if you are interested or have questions with that. Also, our next Summit Grove meeting uh, is going to be September the 13th in a couple of weeks at 10 o'clock. And that will be, if you choose, uh, be followed by a picnic lunch. And uh, one other announcement is the tech team ministry that we have started with now, expanding it not just to recording and uploading and going live and so on, but also now out here in the tent. Uh, volunteers are needed uh, for that. So... Uh, Paul Ward is not here this week, but if you are interested, please see him. Please come talk to me, or if you have questions, Kelly's over here as well. Um, I'm sure he can answer those for you. What seems like months ago, we were going to be having a new member's welcome, and COVID kind of shut that down a little bit. And uh, we were going to have four individuals join the church, and uh, we opened it up again and had four more express interest in joining the church. So today is our welcoming membership Sunday, and I would like to ask if David Ann Carrison, Dawn and Larry Rhodes, uh, Drew and Megan Landis, and Suzanne and Eric Fisher would come up and stand over here with me up in the front. This will be a tad bit different uh, than what we've been used to, but we have Drew and Megan Landis, our first year, then Ann and Dave Carrison, followed by Suzanne and Eric Fisher, and then Dawn and Larry Rhodes. We're receiving these new members into Glenview Alliance Church today, and these all of these folks have attended membership class. We've answered questions that they have, and uh, we are going to be having another membership series coming up in the later part of the fall, so please stay tuned for that. If you are interested, we believe here at Glenview that making this commitment to become members of our family is very important, but I want to make very clear becoming a member has nothing to do with eternal salvation. After attending membership class here at the church, uh, those that were interested turned in applications and had interviews uh, with your elder board and they've testified that they have placed their faith in Jesus Christ as their savior and Lord and therefore their destiny is no issue. Church membership, however, is a very significant step in our Christian lives when we identify with the local body of believers and we make a commitment to be fully engaged in what God is doing in and through our local church. So I have a few questions that I'd like to ask those um, that are making this membership commitment today, and then I'll have a couple of questions for the rest of you, the church family. So for you eight, I'm going to ask each of you a question, and if you could just respond together, uh, yes or no. Number one, do you testify that you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you, your desire is to follow him? Yes. Are you convinced that God is leading you to become a member of Glenview Alliance Church? Are you willing to allow God to use you within this church family to make this body of believers all that God wants it to be? Yes. Amen. Are you willing to allow God to use others in this Glenview family to make you the follower of Jesus that he wants you to be? Yes. When you are offended, this is the difficult one, or hurt by someone, and I can guarantee that will happen. 
When that happens, are you willing to commit to the biblical instruction found in Matthew 18 by going directly to the person who hurt you in order to seek reconciliation? Or if you hear gossip about someone else, which is negative or critical, will you keep quiet or simply encourage the person who gossiped that they need to talk to the person who offended them? Yes. Yes. Amen. To our church family, please, if you agree with these statements, respond by saying amen. Are you convinced that God is adding these brothers and sisters before you to the Glenview Alliance Church family? Amen. Amen. Will you allow God to use you to be a blessing to these eight brothers and sisters so that they may be all that God wants them to be? Amen. 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 Will you allow God to use these new eight members, these brothers and sisters in your life, to become all that he wants you to be? Amen. 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 You know from our statement, our mission statement, we are a growing follower. We are a community of growing followers of Jesus, inviting everyone to experience his love, truth, and hope. And I would like to, along with the elders and the church family, welcome all eight of you to Glenview Alliance Church's official members. Let's give them a round of applause. Any elders that are here, if you um, would just come up and we just want to uh, pray a blessing upon uh, these eight new uh, individuals. Bruce, would you pray for us, please? Sure. Lord, we are so grateful for what you have done for us because you, through your son Jesus, and his payment for sin on the cross, the resurrection from the dead, offers to us the gift of everlasting life and the privilege of being members of your family, being born into your family and of sharing that fellowship one with another as brothers and sisters in your family. Lord, we're particularly grateful this morning for these eight, um, these four couples who have joined this fellowship. Um, Lord, I'm asking that we will be better for it, seeing you working through these people, we're already better for it. I'm asking, Lord, that you will, especially as we just struggle and stumble and fall and bump into walls, not knowing which way to go sometimes because of new directives and different things that are happening in the midst of this COVID um, situation, which has just um, so drastically affected the world. Father, especially during this time, that you will help us to draw on each other's strengths Amen. and draw close to each other, encouraging each other, supporting each other, and that with these new members in this family, Father, that we will, as Jeff already said, be a blessing to them mm. and allow them to be a blessing to us. Please help us to help each other, Father, as we follow you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Can the elbow of fellowship? Yes, we can extend it. Yes. When I call, yeah, actually, you just go right down the line, and then I will just call them There we go. You want to see us? Yes. <laughs>
continue to worship and sing how deep the Father's love for us. not look at ourselves as better than others. Remove that pride, Lord, that we struggle with, that the world wants us to just live in. Help us, Lord Jesus, to live lives of surrender and service to you. Let that be our true form of worship. Thank you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Children are going to be dismissed to the back of the tent, and they will be meeting, I believe, Miss Carolyn and Miss Christy. And parents, you will be picking up your children out in the front underneath um, the little covering after service. So please uh, make sure you do that. Children, you are dismissed.
All right, we are going to continue our discussion on the spiritual gifts here this morning. And if you remember, we did a brief introduction last week, and we looked at Romans 12, verses 1 through 8. We talked uh, a little bit about the first two gifts that are uh, listed there in terms of prophecy and service. And we are going to continue talking about those gifts found in Romans chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles or your devices, if you would turn there to Romans 12 verses uh, 1 through 8. Let's read the Word of God together. If you want to stand, that's fine. I don't want to keep making you go up and down, but if you'd like to stand as we read the Word of God, that's absolutely fine. It says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then, prophes then prophes prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is infallible. And oh God, help us to learn to see, to grab on to what you want us to this morning. And for that, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to begin this morning by looking and talking a little bit about the gift of teaching. The gift of teaching, it seems to me, I know when, when I was a kid growing up in the church, this is something that I always looked at the pastor or one of the Sunday school teachers to do. And it was something that I, I said, I'd love to do that when I get older. And sometimes with the gifts we look at, that very thing. We see what people are doing and say, hey, I want that, but our motives are not pure. Instead of, I want to do this to shake the kingdom of God, it's instead, I want to do this because I want myself elevated. And as a teenager, one of the things I struggled with was, I want to be in the spotlight. And time and again, the Lord had to humble me to say, no, if you're going to do what I want you to, you will listen to my guidance and direction and my way will be done. When we look at the gift of teaching in particular to one of these gifts, James 3.1 warns, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. I never want to misuse the platform that God has given me. And teachers, we do not want to misuse this platform that God has given us to share and declare and to teach the word of God. We as teachers need to be stewards of every word that comes out of our mouth. And teachers are very effective at communicating what they need to communicate. And in this case, as they communicate the word of God, they break it down so that people can understand. You notice when Jesus taught parables throughout his ministry, he taught in ways that people, the common person, could understand. He didn't talk way above their heads so that they were just completely confused, feeling as though they were getting uh, fire hosed upon. But instead, he taught in a practical way so that people could apply and understand so Jesus, I think we all can agree, was an effective communicator. And those that have this gift of teaching effectively are able to communicate. 
And they're able to adjust to their surroundings. They're able to adjust to the individuals that they're trying to communicate with. But not just that. Teachers want to communicate the word of God. But how then we as followers of Jesus, how are we going to use this in 2020? As a school teacher, this is one of the things my students always ask me as we talked about ancient history. They said, sorry, Mr. Bean. Why? Why do I need to learn this? Why do I need to do this? Mathematics was another one. They'd ask me why, 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 why? And there were some things I'll have to be honest. I say, you know what? You're not going to apply, you know, Greek history or ancient history right now. But math, we'll talk about that. So we need to, as we, as teachers teach the word of God, need to know how to communicate this so that they can effectively, so the listeners can effectively uh, apply what they are learning. Those that have the gift of teaching, they love to study the word for extended periods of time. They consume the scriptures. It's not a get off of milk onto solid food kind of a deal. It's they are on solid food and they cannot get enough of it. When you experience the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, it is something that you do not want to ever miss again. I know for me personally, when I experienced the, the moving of the Holy Spirit like I had never had before in my life, it was, I need that every day of my life. Jesus, I need you more and more. And that realization began to click. And those that have the gift of teaching realize they need to be in the Word constantly. They know what God, uh, they want to know what God has revealed of himself and what he requires as you and I have been created in his image and likeness. They, they get great satisfaction, not by getting lots of compliments, but instead by seeing people learning, by seeing those aha light bulb moments as they teach and they're excited to see how the gospel is woven throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. That it's not just a New Testament gospel. It's not just a New Testament ideology. It, it, it's the entire Bible. Everything comes to life as they consume the word of God. They are not going to beat the Bible over someone's head. But instead peacefully and in love teach them so that they can understand they will also never candy coat the Christianity. They will never candy coat the gospel. They will preach it with conviction. And they will teach with conviction. That doesn't necessarily mean they're going, their volume is going to go up. But you can tell that as they teach, they teach out of personal experience. So maybe you have the gift of teaching. Well, maybe you have the gift of encouragement, exhortation. That's the next one we're going to talk about here. This is also known, the gift of exhortation, as I said, is also known as the gift of encouragement. And this word, uh, exhortation, translates to call upon, to encourage, and to strengthen. You know, I'm sure you've all been blessed by people who have given you some encouragement. Whether it's been through a card, through a phone call, an email, a text message. But those that have the gift of encouragement... Remind those that are listening of the powerful promises and the amazing work of Christ that is woven throughout the gospel, particularly in the saving atonement of Jesus on the cross. I know time and again, my best friend, he would drive me crazy, but he would leave scriptures for me when I did something wrong. We would go to summer camp. We were actually on vacation a couple weeks ago. We drove by Mon Alto campus at Penn State, and that just has memory after memory after memory because of a summer camp that I used to go to. And I'll admit it, when I was a teenager, I went there to go talk to girls, not necessarily to go deeper in my faith. And so I was more consumed about pursuing those things. And when I would get disappointed or upset and I'd leave the room, He'd put a little sticky note with scripture verses right on it and lay it on my pillow or put it in my Bible. So when I'd open my Bible or look at my pillow, there were scriptures. I'd say, oh, my goodness, he did it again. <laughs> but those scriptures hit home. And they had a profound effect on my life. 
Because I knew he wasn't doing it to judge me. He was doing it to encourage me, to uplift me. And for that, I was so thankful. How many times in your life have people done that to encourage you? It, it, it's kind of like I got the picture when Matt would do that for me. He would be my cheerleader and say, you can do this. You got this. It's not too difficult. Remember, my grace, Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Hopefully you have people that speak that truth of the word of God into your life. Sometimes, maybe oftentimes when you most need it. And that one scripture, that one word of encouragement uplifts you and gets you through the day. I'm telling you, as we consume the word of God, as we look at the scriptures, I get this picture of Jesus saying, you can do this. When we want to say, I can't, I cannot overcome, I cannot deal with this situation that's going on. He's saying, yes, you can. But you cannot do it in your own strength. Call upon me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. We all have the opportunity to be an encouragement or an encourager to an individual or group of people. I'm not just saying those that have the gift of encouragement should encourage. No, we all are called to encourage and to uplift one another. There are those that have an extra ounce of oomph in their gifting. So when I talk about this gift of encouragement, when I talk about the gift of, of, of giving, please don't say, well, this is just for those people that have the gift. No, no, no. We all have been called to uplift and encourage. It might not be your strength or your gift, but we are all called to do that in some way, shape, or form. And I encourage you to do that. Why? Because you might be the seed that the Holy Spirit uses. You, He may use your word to literally transform your life. Remember I said I was a teenager going to these summer camps. My 92 year old grandma made one statement to me in my rebellion that changed my life. She's about four foot tall. She can barely walk. But I went over to her house because I didn't want to go home because I knew what was waiting for me at home. And I called my mom and dad and I said, listen, I'm going over to Memmi's house. I'm just staying there. She sat down in her recliner and she said, what in the world do you think you're doing? And it was one of those grandma motivation speeches. Okay. Literally, I walked away saying, I don't know if she realized that, but the Holy Spirit just spoke through her. Made me rethink, reshape why I'm doing what I'm doing. I can tell you her gift is giving. It's not encouragement. But she allowed the Holy Spirit to use her in that moment. Because I wasn't listening to anybody else and the Holy Spirit knew that. So I encourage you to encourage others as the Holy Spirit leads you. The next gift that's found here in Romans is the gift of giving in this Word as is translated means to impart or to give. It means not just that, but to sincerely and generously give without pretense or hypocrisy. We, we read in the word of God that the Lord delights in a cheerful giver. We give without pretense or hypocrisy. Right? We, we, we have no motive when we give. The purpose of those that have the gift of giving, what do they do? They meet the various needs of the church and its ministries or the missionaries or people don't, that don't have the means to provide for themselves. Their goal is to provide giving credit to God's love and his provision. One ministry that stands out to me at Glenview is our deacon ministry that sacrifices and gives to those in need. We have been tremendously blessed by those that have stepped up, by those that have given. And I say, let's continue to show others the love of Christ. It might not be money. It might be time. 
It might be a listening ear that someone needs. Are we able to give and give credit to our Lord and Savior? Those that have the gift of giving, they love to share with others the overflow of blessings that God has given them. And they do so cheerfully. They do so joyfully. As we're studying in Wednesday nights, we're going to be starting the, the, the book of James Time and again, in, in, in chapters 1 and 2, we read, the rich do this, the poor do that. And it's, 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 it's all worldly king versus kingdom mentality. I want to tell you, you all, as followers of Jesus, we all, as followers of Jesus, have a gift. We have been set free. Yeah, that's right. That is the greatest gift that any, anyone can have, that anyone can receive. And each one of us that calls ourselves followers of Jesus, if we have trusted Christ as our personal Savior, we have this gift. Jesus said, freely you've received, now freely give. Each one of you has a gift to give. And what is that? That's the saving knowledge of Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So please don't think, I have nothing to give. I have nothing to use. Yes, you do. Use your experiences. Use your life lessons that you have learned over time, albeit the hard way. Use those to help teach, to help instruct, to encourage others. Those that have this gift of giving, other than loving to share with others, they are very hospitable and they will seek out ways and opportunities to help others. It's not like they're going to keep everything and say, this is mine. I'm going to just hold it. I'm just going to hold it. They're not digging a hole and putting everything in there. Instead, they are finding ways because they want others to see and know the goodness of God. We sing that song, don't we? Time, sometimes I, I believe in the goodness of God. God is so good. We sing that, that chorus. He's so good to me. He answers prayer. I love him so. That four-letter word good does him no justice. He is amazing. And we want to give his love away. We want to tell the world about this. I mean, as you're looking this way, just think about the neighborhood behind me. How many of them know the love of Jesus? When was the last time you stopped as you drove through your neighborhood and said, I wonder how many of these people know Jesus? I wonder how many of these people are lost? I wonder how many of these people have been hurt, traumatized by a so-called follower of Jesus that has instead manipulated the word of God? Pray over your communities. Pray over your neighborhoods. Pray for open doors to share because you have got a gift to give away. The gift of leadership is next talked about in Romans. And this gift of leadership is closely related to the gift of administration. And interestingly enough, the spiritual gift of pastor and shepherd, the word translated here means to lead, assist, to protect, to care for others. And I don't find it coincidence that this leadership comes between the two gifts of giving and mercy. Because leaders, those that have the gift of leadership, often will be very strong in the gifts of giving and mercy. The purpose of the gift of leadership is to care for God's people, encouraging them and leading them, getting them excited to go into a deeper relationship with Christ and each other. Time and again, I have been encouraged. I have surrounded myself with people that I know have a deeper relationship with Jesus. They are more spiritually mature than I am. I want to consume what they know. I want to learn how they've got there. Not for my own selfish ambition, because, but instead because I want Christ to do that work in me. 
At the same time, then I'm making sure that I am walking alongside others where I see that passion. I see that hunger for the word of God. I see that desire to go deeper and I want to cheerfully walk alongside them, teaching them what I have learned, albeit the hard way, so that they can be used in the way that God wants them to. Those that have the gift of leadership, they accomplish many different tasks and objectives, but they lead in relationship with others. They have a very deep concern for the well-being of others. A lot of individuals pin this gift of leadership solely on pastors and say, well, every pastor has to be absolutely relational and every pastor has to minister to all congregation like make all the visits and so on i'm saying listen any of us in leadership positions that feel like we have we have been called and it's been confirmed we all need to be relationally we need to build those relationships we need to care for the well-being of others we all need to look at how can we as leaders advance the kingdom of god in the community in the culture in the family that we have We are going to go to great lengths. Leaders are going to go to great lengths to protect their flock. They are going to spend significant time in prayer. They may even spend considerable amount of time in fasting because they see and know issues that people are going through within their body and they are concerned. When was the last time we have wept? over church family members that are going through it? When was the last time we spent a significant amount of time praying for those believers in our church body that are going through it? When was the last time we have reached out to give them encouragement? See, if we have the Holy Spirit gives leaders vision. We know where he wants us to go. And then it's through prayer and discernment that we will get there. It's it's expressing that vision so that others get excited and say, I want that as well. And leaders effectively lead through crisis situations. Do you think we're going through a crisis situation right now? Absolutely. And it's interesting because as, as, as I've been going through this, as Tim and I started, Tim, Nick and I started going through this, and now Nick and I and the, the elders and, and, the, and the governing board continue to go through this. You know, I talk with other pastors, other friends of mine um, that, that are, are dealing with this, and the, the constant comment is you would not believe how many people say, act like we've been through this COVID situation 500 times, and they're expecting answers, and, and they're expecting problems solved immediately. If we are going to effectively lead through crisis situations, there is only one place we look, and it's not at each other, it's up. We look for his guidance and direction, even though it may not make sense. Because we, in our humanness, want things to make sense. We want to rationalize everything instead of saying, Jesus, what do you want us to do? To do? What do you want me to do? What do you want my family to do in this situation? When he begins to give us guidance and direction, you can't, I'm not going to mess with that. If the Holy Spirit gives leadership guidance and direction, who am I to question? Why? There should be that trust level. In any form of leadership, whether it's job, whether it's whether it's ministry, no matter where it is, there has to be that level of trust. Saying, you know what? I may not understand it. I may not agree with it. But this is where the leadership has really sensed the leading. So I'm going to follow that and say yes and amen and help in any way possible. I was challenged a couple of weeks ago by a dear friend of mine. To have conversations with each one of my boys, one-on-one, 
asking them some very difficult questions. And I looked at him and I said, you're nuts. There's no way. I cannot have a conversation. I made maybe Aaron, maybe the 12 year old, but the 10 and the 7 year old, there's no way. He said, Bean, do it. <laughs> and I felt that Holy Spirit conviction. I didn't know what I was doing. So Aaron and I went for a drive. And I said, Aaron, let's talk. Okay, Dad, am I in trouble? <laughs> no. That's the thing you always ask, you know, the boys ask, am I in trouble? And I just started opening up to him. I would, I could not believe it. I could not believe the openness and transparency that he began to have. And I'll tell you, I look at him differently now than I did three weeks ago. But it took my friend saying, do this. I've learned the hard way. Trust me. And I have a good enough relationship with, with this brother that I'm going to do it. So even though things don't make sense sometimes, church family, let's continue to seek the leading of the Holy Spirit. And finally, the gift of mercy. As we look at Romans. All Christians are called to be merciful, but God, because God has been merciful to us, we can find that in Matthew 18, Ephesians 2, and, and so on. The word mercy here, as it is translated, means to be patient and compassionate to those who are suffering and afflicted. The concern for the physical as well as spiritual needs of those who are hurting is covered in this gift of mercy. But there is discernment needed as we think about this. If you just stop and think a moment, how many people do you know act as though they are Physically, they have issues. They're suffering or afflicted emotionally when all they want is that attention. This is when we need to be able to use our spiritual discernment and realize that we need to be compassionate to all. But those that are in need, that have legitimate needs, we need to pour out the love of Jesus in such a significant way. Because again, our words, our actions can literally change their life because we're being led by the Holy Spirit. In James, it talks about do not judge, do not show favoritism in James chapter 2. And sometimes I believe we do that, don't we? We look at someone's outer appearance and say, well, they can't be hurting. They must not need anything. Why would I spend time with them when they are legitimately broken inside and the house is coming down? So we need to ask for discernment through the Holy Spirit. The purpose of the gift of mercy is, is to love and assist those who are suffering. Walk with them until the Lord allows their burden to be lifted. That takes a lot of time. That takes a lot of patience. Because you may be walking with someone for years. And again, that's where the discernment is so vital because we need to allow the Holy Spirit to say to us, which ones do you want me to minister to, to minister with, to walk alongside of? In Romans 12, we're instructed in verse 15 to weep with those who weep. In Galatians 6 verse 2, we're told to bear one another's burdens. Those that have this gift of mercy legitimately walk. Those scriptures, they live out those scriptures. They have great empathy for others in their trials and sufferings. They're able to come alongside those for extended periods of time and see them through this healing process. Healing, don't we want healing to be instantaneous? Don't we? I, I, this, this really comes out to me in, in terms of, of, of the passing of a loved one in grief. And those of you that are grieving or have, that have gone through this grieving process know. Some people, like, they legitimately cannot understand why you're still grieving over the loss of a loved one. It may have been months. It may have been years. But we cannot, this is a, it's called a healing process, a grieving process, right? But so many people want it to be just like that and we're done. Act like everything's fine. What's wrong with you? Why are you still down? 
It's a process. And those that have the gift of mercy understand that healing and change is a process. Can the Holy Spirit let it happen, allow it happen, allow it to happen in a moment? Absolutely. But most of the time, this is a significant process. Those that have the gift of mercy are literally and truly the hands and feet of God to the afflicted. They are good listeners and like to be there for others. Again, in James, doesn't it talk about that? We're supposed to be slow to speak and quick to listen. As the rain begins to fall. Come on, Holy Spirit. Come on in. some water warriors. <laughs> so here's the question. I'll wrap this up. <laughs> always present, uh, get done. So where do we go from here? What, what, what can we do? As, as I said before uh, last week, I really want to encourage you to be watchful for opportunities to use your giftings the Holy Spirit has given you, not just for others, but to build up the Glenview Alliance Church family. Do not allow issues, do not allow troubles, gossip, factions, dissensions, any issue to stir up without addressing them. And ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what your giftings would be, whether that comes through a spiritual gifts inventory, whether it's we sit down and begin to have conversations, do that. Because as I said, we are a body made up of many parts. Each one of us has our own uniquenesses and functions. The question is, are we using those uniquenesses and those giftings to the glory of God so that his kingdom, his church can be advanced? That's what we want to do. That's why we are here worshiping. We want kingdom advancement for his Glory. As we've said time and again, it may not be easy. It may push us and stretch us, but that's a good push and a good stretch. Examine yourself. Holy Spirit, what would you like me to do? Bring to mind my giftings. Help. Just reveal that to me as I'm going about my week, as I'm going about my day. I want to serve you. That's what's going to attract the presence and power of the Holy Spirit is that humility, is that heart of surrender. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you for this time. Thank you for everything that you've done in our life. <clears throat> Father, in this t these, these times of questions and change and everything that's going on, we thank you that you are the certainty in our life, that you are the foundation, that you are our everything. We worship you, Lord, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to close our uh, our service today by singing um, a part of uh, the song "Good Good Father." It is not on your or uh, your uh, lyric sheet, but we're going to sing the chorus and uh, and the bridge. Uh, you're a good good father. It's who you are. You are perfect in all of your ways. Let's stand. <laughs>
us, even with all of our faults and all of our imperfections. Thank you that you are continuing to create a masterpiece with each one of us. Lord, I pray we would just lay ourselves down, that we would be humble and surrender and submit to your workings, your doings, and your leadings. Lord, as we go from this place, let us be the salt and light that you have called us to be. Open doors and help us to joyfully run through them, to share the good news of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.